Hello everyone, welcome back to AS and A Level Biology with Dr. Demi. I am Dr. Demi and in this video I want to continue with chapter 19 which is the last chapter of the A Level Biology syllabus. So I hope those of you who have been on a journey with me throughout this channel have found many of my videos helpful, at least all of them helpful and I hope that you are practicing past questions in preparation for your exams because that is really the best way to prepare to make sure that whatever it is that you are learning in the class classroom or here on YouTube with me, you are going into the past questions and trying to apply them because that is what will guarantee your success. So I hope that you're doing that. I know the videos for chapter 19 and 18 seem a bit um, staggered because I'm not releasing them the same way that I would, but I want you to know that for most of the content that you have to learn in these last two chapters, um, it's just a matter of you being able to read through them. So I hope that you find them helpful um, when I post the video, but you also find it easy to just go into the textbook and cover whatever is not on the videos yet. Um, for those of you who did not join the live lesson, um, there's a video on May, June 2019 paper one questions where I spent time in a live classroom just answering questions with other students. And so I hope that you're able to go through that. It's about two hours and 30 minutes long, but I hope that it helps you as you start to um, work on the question papers yourself. I am hoping to do a paper two, but maybe not do it live. I will try to record it um, so that you're able to also find that helpful as you prepare for your exams. Also, one last thing that I just want to say is that um, even though the syllabus is changing for next year's exams, most of the content is still the same. So you can still use the videos on this channel to study for your exams. All right. So don't worry too much. Don't stress about it. Um, just a little bit of like just bits and pieces of information might be missing. But um, most of the content is covered in the videos that I have already done. All right, so today we are looking at the processes in genetic technology. In the last video, we sort of looked at the tools for genetic technology and an introduction to general genetic technology. And in that video, I explained to you that genetic technology really has to do with uh, being able to cut fragments of DNA um, and using restriction enzymes and all of those things. In this video, I just want to introduce you to three key processes that can be used in genetic technology. Those are gel electrophoresis, polymerase chain reaction and microarrays. And I will explain what each process is for um, so that you have an understanding of them. So the first one is gel electrophoresis. And what gel electrophoresis is used for is to separate um, different molecules. So different sizes of molecules or charges of molecules, depending on what you're dealing with. Um, usually in the lab, I'm just going to use my red pen here. This is what a gel electrophoresis machine would look like. So you have this um, as a sort of electric supply and the gel is usually made and put into a chamber like this one, like so. And if you look here, I want you to pay attention here. You see that you can see some very thin lines there. Those are actually wells. So if you want to do gel electrophoresis, for example, on a DNA sample, what you would do is you take that DNA sample and you cut it into fragments using restriction enzymes. So if you didn't watch the video before this one, please go and do so, so you know what a restriction enzyme is. You use restriction enzymes to cut the DNA into fragments and then you stain the DNA. So you have to stain it with a dye so that it is visible and you can then load that DNA into these wells over here. Once you load the DNA into the wells, you connect the gel to an electric source. That is why you have these two wires here. And what that would do is that it will feed electricity into the gel that would then cause the movement of the fragments that you have cut um, because of the way this one is looking, it's going to move in that direction. Um, and the way that the molecules would move would be in response to different factors, such as the net charge. So usually if you're dealing with something that has a negative charge, it will move towards the positive um, side of the gel, which would be the anode. And if you're dealing with a positively charged molecule, it will move towards the cathode, which is the negative um, charged part of the gel. You can also have movement based on molecular sizes. So you have like smaller molecules would move faster than the bigger ones. But the point of the gel electrophoresis is basically that you apply an electric charge or an electric field to a gel and that enables the fragments that you have cut with restriction enzymes to separate. So they separate into even smaller fragments um, that you can then see with UV light if you stain the if you stain the gel properly. Just to say that when you do gel electrophoresis, the composition of the gel is very important. Polyacrylamide is used for the separation of proteins, whereas if you're dealing with 
DNA, you use agarose gels. And so when you go to your classroom and you're um, do doing this topic, please ask your teacher, by all means, if your school has the means to demonstrate this, to show you how a gel electrophoresis happens. Or better still, you can also go on YouTube and search for gel electrophoresis and just watch a scientist set it up so that you fully understand um, what happens. Also, just to say that when you're doing gel electrophoresis, uh, particularly for a protein, you have to do that at a constant pH. And this is because proteins get affected by a change in pH. So you don't want your fragments to separate wrongly because the pH is just not what it should be. So you would use a buffer for that. Uh, but usually this is not a question that I have seen very often. But again, if you're writing from next year, you might get some unusual questions because it's a new syllabus. Um, so please, by all means, just pay attention to every extra information that you can get uh, while I'm speaking. Um, you can also use gel electrophoresis to separate alleles of the same genes and you can use them for genetic, you can use gel electrophoresis for genetic profiling. Now, when you do the gel electrophoresis, like I said, remember you have to stain the DNA and once the whole um, process of the separation is done and you've turned off the gel, you can actually take that and take a photo of it. And this is what the photo would look like. Um, so these light bands over here, uh, fragments of DNA. This is something I feel the need to make very clear to students because I've had students make this error before where they assumed that the light bands meant that there was nothing there. So they assumed those were empty spaces and we're looking at the dark regions here as the fragments of DNA. Please note that the dark regions are not fragments of DNA. Those are the spaces where you don't have DNA. These light fragments that look like they have fluorescence on them, those are your DNA fragments. So over here, for example, you can see there's some separation from this over here, but there are no fragments that you can see very clearly. Um, so these are your fragments, the light band. All right. So just thought to put that um, out there and make it clear so that you don't make the same mistakes. Um, I also thought it would be interesting for you to see how gel electrophoresis is applied because again with biology if the content is too abstract for students they tend to struggle with seeing it so I'm just going to use these two examples which I got from the textbook the textbook is the um, AS Cambridge AS and A level biology course book by Mary Jones et al so if you want to know what it looks like just go to my very first video that's chapter 1.1 and you'd be able to see a, a picture of the cover page I don't know if it has been updated now that the syllabus is changing but that's the textbook I've used for the past three years um, so here the applications of gel electrophoresis so if you just look here if for example we say that um, we're trying to do a paternity test so that is one of the ways gel electrophoresis might be used you're trying to do a paternity test so you want to determine if this man is the father of this child what you can do in that case is you can take the DNA of the mother the DNA of the child and the DNA of the father you don't even have to take the DNA of the mother if you don't feel ne it's necessary to do so but in this case this example here you can see that they have and they also have a control DNA so the control DNA obviously doesn't belong to either mother or father or child it's just DNA by itself and so you see here that a certain section of the DNA has been cut and then further cut and then put into um, the a certain section of the DNA has been cut into fragments and then loaded onto this gel so this is where it has been loaded over there and then separated into fragments and you can see here for the mother what the fragments look like and you can also see the father over here and what you can then do is you can compare the bands for the child with that of the mother and the father to see how many similarities are there and use that to determine whether or not this father is um, the right father for the child so in this case here we can see there that's the child and the father they have two bands at the same location um, over here well the father has a band but the child doesn't that doesn't matter that might be a band in the mother but over here you can see there are other bands here again there are more bands um, and you can see there just seem to be like some similarities this is not actually on the same position uh, but again you can see more bands here more bands here and more bands there and so in this case this could be the child's father 
Um, so one thing you would notice is that the bands that are in the child will be present either in the father or in the mother. So in this case, this is a possibility, but obviously we are not um, on a show where we reveal fathers and paternity tests. So we can't say for sure, but I'm just telling you that that is an example. Another example, and this is one that I love using with my students, and I'll try to paint a picture here for you as well, is you can use gel electrophoresis to analyze a crime scene. So let's say, for example, in your school, there's a biology lab and somebody breaks into the biology lab and steals, um, say, the aquarium or the skeleton or whatever it is. And on their way out, they take a bite of your teacher's sandwich and leave the rest of it there on the table. What they've done is that they've left their DNA behind because it's in their saliva. So by biting into the sandwich or maybe just drinking from a bottle of water on the desk, they have already left some DNA behind. So what we can then do in that case is we can say, OK, first of all, we would be interested in stealing the aquarium in the biology lab. Um, and we pick out a person or we pick out a group of people. So those would be our suspects. And in this case, we then take the DNA from the crime scene, which is the DNA around the bottle of water or whatever is left on the sandwich from when they um, bit into it. And we take that DNA, we cut it into fragments, and then we gather our suspects and also extract DNA from them. So if you watch a lot of TV, you've probably seen cases where they swab the inside of the cheeks um, just to get some DNA from people. And so you take the DNA from the suspects and you cut them into fragments as well obviously using the same restriction enzymes as the one you used for the DNA at the crime scene and then you run those DNA fragments on a gel electrophoresis and what you can then do is compare which one matches the DNA at the scene of the crime so that you can determine who your actual culprit is so in this case let's look at this this is the uh, blood that has been found at the crime scene over here right so you can see all those fragments there and in this case now we have to figure out which one of these seven suspects match those so this obviously is a lot of observation work because you have to pay careful attention but already i can see here there's a match here there's a match here there's a match there as well there's another match here another match here and uh based on what i can see it seems like suspect number three is the culprit and this is one of the ways gel electrophoresis is used um, to do a dna fingerprint and figure out who's the perpetrator of a crime or anything like that so you can use dna um, you can use gel electrophoresis for dna profiling in crime scene analysis okay now let's move to the second one which is the polymerase chain reaction so the first one was gel electrophoresis and i just showed you what gel electrophoresis can do uh, well i didn't show you i sort of explained it um in this one polymerase chain reaction it is a process that is used to multiply the copy of dna that you have so let's say for example you want to um, modify genetically modify a yeast cell or a bacterial cell so yeast for example saccharomyces cerevisiae is the common yeast that you would use for like bread making and it's able to ferment sugar that's why it's able to make bread but let's say let's say we want to take that gene that enables it to ferment sugar and put it in a bacterium we can't just isolate that one gene and then try to transpose that into a bacterium and just say okay well as long as we just do this one gene it's fine we need to make many copies of the gene so that we can infect as many or should i say transform as many bacterial cells as possible um, in order for us to achieve the results that we want so the polymerase chain reaction is used to do that um, it has three key steps and i'm going to tell you what those steps are and the temperatures that are um, involved in each one and obviously when you see the temperatures you'll realize that there might be a problem if you are thinking of it as a conventional process so this is what the polymerase chain reaction cycle would typically look like. I got this image from yourgenome.org and here is a double stranded DNA. So I'm just going to use my red pen to show you that these two rods here are representing a double stranded DNA. And what you have first in the polymerase chain reaction is what we call the denaturation step. So if you've watched the video on enzymes, you already know that to denature something means that you are more or less loosening the bonds between that thing. And so in this case, denaturation is the separation of the two strands of DNA, so breaking the bonds between them. And that happens at about 96 or 95 degrees Celsius. 
Then you have the annealing step. And the annealing step involves the addition of primers. So again, if you're not sure what primers are, watch chapter six um, on my channel and you'll learn what primers are when we discuss um, DNA replication. So you have primers that then attach to the denatured strands of DNA. And that happens at about 55 to 65 degrees Celsius. And then you have an extension um, stage, which is then when you have more or less copies of this DNA being made or the DNA fragment. Now, now, looking at the temperatures, you can already tell that they are really high and they are too high for any human enzyme to be able to function at. So at 95 degrees, for example, all your enzymes would have probably just been completely denatured, broken down, and you would probably be dead. So when we do polymerase chain reaction, one of the enzymes that we use is called TAC polymerase. So we don't use DNA polymerase during this extension step. Because if we use DNA polymerase, it will be denatured and be affected by the heat. So TAC polymerase is a heat-stable DNA polymerase that was isolated from a bacterium called Thermus aquaticus. And the name Thermus aquaticus just already suggests hot water. Okay, so that's another thing with uh, microbiology names. You can sort of guess um, in some instances what the source is. So this simply means this bacterium is able to survive in places that are really hot. And so for that reason, its DNA polymerase is stable and can be used in PCR. So TAC polymerase is good for two reasons. It is not destroyed during the denaturation step. So it means that when you start this step, you can put the double-stranded DNA the tag polymerase and any other thing that you might need, even the primers into the same container and just run the process. So there's no need for you to go back and forth with the process trying to change things because the tag polymerase, by the time it gets to the extension step, it is still intact and it is able to function. It has a high optimum temperature, so there's no need to reduce the temperature um, for elongation. There's no need to more or less change anything. So it makes it very easy for you to put all that you need into like a tiny vial, put it in the PCR machine, and the machine will do all that you need to get done. So now to the last one, which are the microarrays. Microarrays are usually used to find um, the genes that are present in an in an organism's genome and also to find which genes are expressed at a particular time. This particular process for many students tend to be confusing, so I will try as much as possible to explain it in a way that you can get it. You can use microarrays to compare DNA species, um, DNA from two different species, so it's sort of just to tell, well, are they related or not, you can do that. And you can use um, um, microarrays to also check which genes are active. So I'm just going to um, do an explanation on the next slide, which I hope will be helpful, or oh, rather on the other side. So first things first, for you to determine which genes are active, you need to find the mRNA. You then take that mRNA, convert it to cDNA, um, which is copy DNA, um, and then you increase number of DNA using PCR, you label the DNA with fluorescent tags, you then put it on a probe on the microarray, which allows it to hybridize, and the fluorescent spots will tell you which genes are active. And I'm sure for many of you that just went over your head right now because you're like, wait, what? So I'm going to do like a drawing on the next slide, which we all know I'm horrible at, but I hope that you get the gist when I do it. So let us get started. Let's assume um, that we want to check, for example, which genes are expressed in cancer cells and which genes are not. So the first thing that we would do is we would get cells from a person who doesn't have cancer okay so we take those cells and the way we can tell um if genes are being expressed is that we look for rna okay so remember when we did protein synthesis we said that we go from dna to rna all right now when we go from dna to rna during protein synthesis that is evidence that we are trying to express that particular gene from which the rna was made so you, I hope you get that. If you don't, please, please watch chapter six. Don't miss out on that. So we go and we take the RNA and we use reverse transcriptase, which is the enzyme that is found in HIV. We use that enzyme to take it from RNA to DNA. So here we go. We start, I'm just going to use my, um, I think I'll use a black pen here. So we start from our DNA, obviously. Okay. And we go to RNA from there. 
So when we are looking for cells to extract or genes that are being expressed, we usually look out for the RNA and it's usually the messenger RNA. We take this messenger RNA, we convert it back to DNA. All right. Now we've converted back to DNA and we call that cDNA or copy DNA. And those cDNA would be single stranded because remember when you make mRNA, you make single strands. So if we are taking the RNA back to DNA, we just make a single strand DNA. We then take that DNA, say from the normal cells and from the cancer cells, we take whatever we've gotten and we label them. So let's say for the normal cells, we label it as um, green. Okay. And for the cancer cells, let's say we label it as red. Okay, so this is cancer, this is normal. We can then take our microarray plate, which is something that looks like that. And in the microarray plate, what you will see is that there are many holes in there. Okay, well, not holes, let's call them wells. So they're not holes because they're not hollow. They're more like spaces where you can put little things. And each of these tiny spaces, they are what we call probes. So the probes are complementary to different DNA fragments from whatever organism or species you might be dealing with. So now we've labeled our normal cells as green and we've labeled our cancer cells as red. These obviously are not in powder form, they're in liquid form. So we pour them over the microarray plate. And what will happen with these um, fragments is that they will hybridize wherever they find a complementary strand. So let's say that in green, fragment number one finds a complementary strand, maybe in well number 12, it will hybridize there. And the same thing with the red ones, they would also hybridize wherever there is a complementary strand. Once the hybridization has been completed, you wash off whatever excess DNA or probes you have left, and then you view the microarray. What will happen is that wherever you see green only, that means that only the normal cell is expressing that particular fragment of DNA. Wherever you see red only, that means that only the cancer cell is expressing that particular fragment of DNA. Wherever you see a combination of those two colors, so I think I'm not sure what the combination of green and um, red is anymore. Let me just check. Actually, I can't determine that based on the choices I've made, but this is the primary color spectrum. So if you have red and yellow, you will express orange. If you have yellow and blue, you'll express green, blue and violet, you'll express indigo. Um, but okay, well, let's just, let's just say you have a combination and that combination comes off as yellow. That then tells you that this gene is expressed in both a person who has cancer and a person who is normal. Wherever there is only red, that tells you that only the cancer cells are expressing this particular gene, while people with normal cells do not express this particular fragment or section of the DNA. If you have only green showing, that tells you that only normal people express this, whereas in the cancer cell, that gene has been turned off. So this is what microarrays are used for. I hope that was clear. I can just go over it again very quickly so that um, you don't miss out. Let's just go again from the beginning. So we are trying to check, for example, what gene is expressed in the cancer cell and what gene is not expressed, for example. So maybe we say a person has cancer, we want to figure out which sections of the DNA are affected because of this cancer. In this case, we can do what we can do, as I've explained, is that we can take the mRNA from the person who has cancer and take mRNA from someone who does not have cancer. So the person who doesn't have cancer will then be like our control experiment. We take the mRNA from the two of them and we reverse transcribe them into DNA. So that's copy DNA. Copy DNA is single stranded. So we reverse transcribe them into copy DNA. And let's say we label the person with cancer, we label them with red. I'll choose my colors better this time. We label the person with cancer with red and we maybe label the person with without cancer um, with green. Okay. Okay, I don't think I made a different choice, but let's just move on. So we label the cDNA from the cancer cell with red. We label the cDNA from the person without cancer with green. All right. We then take that mixture and we pour it over the microarray plate. On the microarray plate, you will see that there are tiny wells. All right. There are tiny wells. And in each well, there are probes. So those probes, think of them as primers, like short fragments of DNA. 
all right so we pour the mixture over the entire microarray plate now wherever there is a complementary strand for maybe a green or a normal um, DNA fragment it will bind to the probe in that well and that well will turn green if the probe is for the red one so if it's complementary only to the red fragment the red fragment will bind to that probe and that section of the microarray plate will turn red in some cases you might find that the genes are expressed in both the normal cell and the cancer cell which means both fragments will bind at that particular spot and it will then give off a different color let's just say the color is yellow okay so in this way you can then tell which um, gene is expressed in a cancer cell only because that section will just be red and you can also tell which gene is expressed in a normal cell only because that section will just be green for the genes that are expressed in both normal and cancer cells you will see that part of the microarray plate as yellow and of course this again is just an example the colors might be different but I hope that you understand. If you don't, please ask a question. I spent some time on this because usually when I teach my students this, we have to go over it again and again and again. Um, I would encourage you to watch some videos on microarrays on YouTube as well, because that might be helpful in just helping you visualize what is happening. But I hope that this video was at least helpful to some extent or that it helped you just grab it fully. Um, all right. So that's it from me for now. I will try as much as possible to do some extra videos. But for the rest of this chapter, it's really just about reading the applications of genetic technology in medicine and in agriculture. So most of the videos would not be necessarily teaching you stuff is more like giving you information um which i don't mind doing but they might just take some time to get there but i hope that you found all the videos helpful so far for those of you writing in um october november good luck ahead of time and i hope you're preparing hard until the next video everyone have a good time